Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. Oh, cool. Five bucks. Wait! What the? That's so weird. I thought I heard something. You did. You know what you should do. You should go and treat yourself to a frappuccino. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. What you really need to do is save for college your kids. College for okay, your kids. Okay, okay. Wait! Actually, you really need to be donating to charity. Tiny uh. I am so glad to see you guys on this brisk, you know, fall morning. I was freezing death coming out. I thought, oh, I dressed inappropriate. <laughs> Winter's upon us, right? Well, guys of you that... Uh, have sent in uh, to Pastor Andy cards and get well wishes and email. He's receiving them, and he loves them, and he said to tell you thank you, okay? Now, today, uh, we are celebrating, well, this weekend, we're celebrating Veterans Day, right? It's the day that we celebrate the men and women who serve our country. Uh, and so, in the spirit of that, I would ask that if you are currently serving or you have served, would you stand up so our congregation can appreciate you? Yeah, just stand up. Give them a welcome. Yeah. Thank you, guys. All right, you can have a seat. All right, you know, what they do means so much to us. And so we can thank them like we did this morning, but I'm going to encourage all of you guys. We all know military people because of where we live at, right? The Hanton Roads area is full, chock full of the military. So I would encourage you to go one step further to actually show appreciation if, if they're your neighbors or you run into them to actually not only extend your hand and thank them personally, but look to do some kind of kind deed. And it doesn't have to be just today. We can take the next, next couple weeks and do that. Just let them know that we are there for them and then incorporate them into your prayer, okay? Very important. We want to appreciate our military. All right, well, we are in a series called Money Talks. And today I want to uh, show you how to answer money when it says, free me. I want you to free me. So what are we talking about there? We're talking about the whole issue of debt, okay? And so I'm going to talk about that today. But, you know, in preparing for my message today, uh, I couldn't help but think about the recent elections that have just taken place, right? And here you go. As a backdrop, I know there are a lot of issues, but as I see it, one of the major issues and things that were going on, a backdrop, was this whole idea of money and money talking to people, and I think people were responding back to money issues in their own lives, you know, wh however they voted. And so you see this uh, money, it talks all the time, and so we want to be in front of getting those answers and talking back to it, not letting it control us, but us controlling it. Now, how do I think that money is the backdrop? Well, things like when I hear about the importance of finding jobs or having jobs, getting paid more in jobs, right? or about health care, having health care, can I afford it, you know, can I, you know, have it where I need it and stuff like that, or am I going to lose it, those kinds of concepts or rebuilding the infrastructure, it's all this backdrop of money, and even the debt being 20 trillion dollars was a backdrop, and I really do think that it played a major uh, role in our election that we just saw. So today, when we are continuing in our series, Money Talks, listen, guys, it is talking. And again, you want to be proactive to handle your, your finances and your money and those angst that come upon you in a way that is honoring to the scripture and who you are as a Christ follower, okay? So very important. And before I jump in, I just want to make one other comment. You know, I've had a lot of time sitting because of Pastor Annie, where he's at, sitting with him and uh, talking with him and, you know, just being with him, comforting him. Well, we have watched an enormous amount of television, right? And I have seen our country in so much pain. 
And that bothers me. And I'm not going to stand up here or justify it or condemn it. I think the media is doing a pretty good job of that by itself. But I want to say this to my spiritual family, and that's each and every one of you. We are not without weapons. God says that the weapon that we have is the word of God. It's the ability to go before him and to talk to him. And so I want to encourage you to do that, to pick up the word of God, to start to read it and to talk with him in each and every day. And we are told to trust the Lord with all of our heart, right? And to lean not on our understanding, but to seek after his ways and what he wants. And in that, and in doing that, that we will know the directions that we're supposed to take and the things we're supposed to do. And we can be that light on a hill that shines out for everybody that we are a different breed of people, that we serve not a political movement, but a God. The God Almighty is who we serve, and we represent him in everything that we do. These are stressful times, and the only true peace that there is to ha be had is in a relationship with Jesus Christ, to run to him. And so that's what I'm going to say today before I even get into money talks, because I really feel like uh, our country is at a place of such turmoil, and I think it's incumbent upon us who know the truth to lift it up. So let's just take a few moments. I want you to bow your heads, and I'm going to pray for the message and also pray for our country, okay? So right where you're at, just bow your heads. Holy Spirit, I ask that you come and that you'd fill this room up. Mm. Yeah. So I bind that spirit that would cause division and angst and anger in this room. Father God, you say that in unity, we can do all things, Father. In unity with whom, you say? In unity with the Father God. He's got it all under control. He's walking. It doesn't matter what the world is doing. He says he's got another plan. And you are his ambassadors. So, Father, I ask, as one who has such a, a heart that loves and I see so much pain, I ask that you, Holy Spirit, would come in and that we would use each person in this room, Lord God, in a mighty way to, to, yeah, I see that, to trump a vision that's already out there, to trump the vision of God who is the God of all things, the God of love, the God of hope, the one that is searching always for those that are lost. And so, Father, I ask that you would be glorified in all that we do and come and help, Father, help us as we are looking at the, the money issues that we all wrestle with. Father, we want to serve you, the one true king, above all things. And so, Holy Spirit, your presence, it can come and move in this room in any way you want. Come, Father, and help me to, to deliver the word that you've placed in my heart today. I love you and trust you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, guys, I do want to talk to you today about uh, part four of our money talks. And I want to talk to you about when money says, free me, free me. And here's the big idea. I'll tell you right up front what I'm after. God wants us to be free from debt, okay? And debt is bondage. That's pure and simple, that debt is bondage. And God wants us to be free. And so that's my big idea of what I want to share with you today. So let's jump in and take a look at that. Number one, uh, debt is bondage. How do I get this? How do I get this? Well, Proverbs 22, 7 says this on your outline. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender, right? So what we see here is that a borrower, someone who is borrowing money, right, becomes a slave to the lender. The borrower becomes a slave to the lender. Why? Because the lender has a part of you when you borrow from them. And so if you're not sure about that, just think about this. If you bought a car, you borrowed money to buy a car, who really owns that car? If you're unsure, don't make a payment. <laughs> They'll come and take it, right? Or if you bought your home and you borrowed money to buy that, who owns that home? The lenders do. The lenders do. You know, if you don't pay your mortgage, they foreclose on you, right? So they're really the owners of those things. So whenever we, you know, borrow money, we actually become a slave and they actually have part of us. And why is that so important? Because it, it inhibits our freedom to move and to do whatever the Lord tells us to do. It kind of hampers us from being free. In other words, it, it ties us down to the lender because we ha you know, have an obligation to them to repay this debt. 
So it also will govern things that we do, like a job. We might not like a job, but we have to take it because it pays a certain amount of money so it can pay the debt that I'm in, right? Or I can't help my kids go to college. Why? Because I have so much debt. I've settled myself down with so much debt. Or I have to work those extra hours because I'm a slave to debt and to pay it. So what we see here is that, uh, that, that owning, owing people or owing large amounts of money, assuming debt in our lives, right? Here you go. It is common to everybody that's in this room, okay? Every one of us wrestles with this. So why? Why, if we believe that God says that it is bondage, do we get involved in it? Why, right? Well, I want to answer those. On your outline, I believe that debt is a, a positive, uh, has a positive attitude in our culture today that is viewed as a positive thing, not a neg thing, negative thing. You see, when I was growing up, and I was younger in the 60s, right? Debt was discouraged. It wasn't something that was looked upon as being good, and credit card debt especially. Now, if you don't have a credit card, you are the oddball, right? You're the oddball. In the banking industry, they now look at people that have credit cards, and if you're like me, I try to pay them off every month, right? So if I have a credit card and I pay it off every month, you know what they call me? A deadbeat, <laughs> right? Because I don't want to pay their interest. That's what they refer to somebody like me. So if you think back to a deadbeat, are people that don't pay their bills. They're not people that pay them, right? So our whole attitude is shifting. You can even see that in this game of life. I brought it in here, and I know you're wondering, what is she going to do with the game of life today, right? Well, my father was in the military, and so we moved around all the time. And we loved board games. And this was one, one of the ones that we played, you know. We used to spend hours doing it, and it was simulating life. You know, you'd spin the little spinner, right? And you'd find out whether you're going to college or you're going to get a job, whether you're going to get married. You know, and you had this, like, little car. I love it. The little car, if you got married, you got to put a little somebody in your car. If you got, you know, had children, pinks with the girls, right, blues with the boys. You guys got to remember this. <laughs> It was a blast, and my funnest part was when I won, because I had the most cash. I'd always beat my sister. I never let her forget that, <laughs> right? And so I just enjoyed that game immensely. Well, to my chagrin, about in 2007, they redid their game, right? The game of life now has changed, and what we have is the game of life with twists and turns, and here it is here. I had one of my staff members get it for me, and all... Now, what's so unique about this one? There's no more cash. We purchase things now on credit cards. <laughs> and we play the same game with the same parts, but all the transaction is done through credit card exchange. Guys, we're teaching our children now, our great children, our grade school children, that debt is a fun and acceptable thing. Do you see that? You know, the banking industry that is credit card crazy is not just going after our young adults, right, and our youth for giving them applications for credit cards. But no, they're now going after grade school kids. I want to stand up and say, whoa, stop. Stop, let's think about this. You see, debt is a product, and it's a commodity, and it's being sold to us, and we are buying it lock, stock, and barrel. And I want to call the whistle and I say, wait a minute, let's think about this. You guys are intelligent people. And I want you to think about what's happening here. You know, I read a statistic that in 2014, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, and Discover, Discovery, they spent $7 billion advertising to you. $7 billion, right? I mean, how many of you get like six or more of these invites to new credit cards every month? I know, I do, right? They inundate me with those. And so we see that they're spending lots of money trying to get me to buy into that, and you, why? Because it's a billion-dollar industry on making interest, on making interest on you and on me, and we need to know that. Now, I googled uh, creditcards.com because I wanted to see in 2016 what were some of the stats, and this is what I found. Listen to this. The average credit debt uh, among the households with, you know, people with credit cards was $15,700. $15,700 with a household, with all their credit cards when you add them all up, right? And then I found the interest rates, they go anywhere from 13 and a half all the way up to 23, 24%. Guys, that means in one year, 
you know, given the average household using their credit cards, they will spend an average of $7,000 per year on credit. $7,000. And 20 or 200,000 Americans have credit cards. And one in 10 of those Americans, right, have more than 10 credit cards in their wallet, right? And in this report, it said that 80% of them are at their credit limit already. They're reporting being at their credit limit, and 37% of the people say that they have used one credit card to pay off another credit card. Gosh, right? It's what I call, I, I, when I see stuff like this, I go, dang, Skippy, things are getting weird around here, <laughs> right? This is, this is intense. It's very intense, these stats that I'm bringing to you, right? The game, our attitude, where America has shifted. And in Romans 12, too, this is what I want to say. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. In other words, use your common sense. Allow scripture to speak to you. Allow it to challenge you in the way that you do business, right? Because we know that debt creates bondage. It's like being bound up. And so God's saying, move away from that. So here you go. I got a tip. Next time you go to a store like, um, I don't know, Macy's or Dick's, right? Sporting's good. Next time you go there and you're paying for your good to leave, your goods to leave, and they go, hey, would you like to sign up for a credit card today? You get 30% off that entire purchase, right? <laughs> Sounds so good. You look at them and go, no. Okay, no, not a good deal, not a good deal. All right, next thing I want to say about debt and the bondage that it creates is number two, debt is uh, very costly over the long run. It's a costly adventure. Remember that creditcard.com that I was referring to? One of the stats that intrigued me, and this is especially so because I love young people, right? But I saw that 84% of college students use plastic. Okay? They use plastic on average, uh, their average purchases. And so that meant that their average debt that they carried is $3,100. These are all averages, right? And their minimum payment is $79. And guess what? College students will pay their minimum, uh, minimum balance, right? Which is exactly what the bank wants you to do. And so for owing that $3,100 and making the interest payments to that and paying it off, do you know how long it's going to take you to pay that off? 19 years. 19 years to pay that debt off. And by the time you fit, and that's, and that's if we don't add more debt, which we all know that, that we tend to use that credit card, and so it gets lost. We're not seeing the fact that we are, you know, it's taking us that long because we just keep recharging and put a little bit more money, recharging and stuff. But if we were to take that amount of money, guys, listen, in 19 years, of paying that off if you did no other charging, you're going to pay $4,183 in interest. Holy cow. Really? I can't make this stuff up. And it's not just young people. It's all of us. We get sucked up into this vortex and this lie that says that acquiring debt, especially on credit card, is this easy, great thing to do. Right? And, I, and we need to be able to say, no, that's not a good deal. I'm not going to do that. You see, in the long run, it costs us a lot of money for this indebtedness that I'm talking about. And here you go. It's not just the fact that you're paying for an item and you're paying a lot more for that item than you think because the interest, but that compounding interest that works against you on a credit card, if you didn't make that purchase and you took that money and you put it in savings, then the compound interest would begin to work for you. You'd be on the positive side, not on the negative. So I see credit card debt as being a double whammy. We get hit by paying the interest ra rates, right? And the interest on that thing, and we lose out because we don't put our money to work for us. Not at all. Now, Proverbs 27, 12 says, the prudent see danger. Credit cards are dangerous. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. We have to be wise to know that credit cards are dangerous for us in the long run, and so we need to stand up and say, no, nah, I'm going to look at this thing. I'm going to take it seriously, okay? So another thing I wanted to show you before I got off this debt is, is not good is to look at this whole idea of the relationships, okay? Debt is not wise in relationships. Now, I happen to think that debt 
and, and in our relationships actually ruins relationships, causes a lot of, a lot of strife in marriages and in homes. And so we have to be very careful about this whole debt idea. And it also extends to lending out money, right? You know, how many of you guys, you don't have to show me by hand, but how many of you lent money to a friend or a family and then the debt like changes, the money there, it changes the relationship, doesn't it? I know, I've done this. It changes it. it. It puts more pressure on it. It's hard. So we need to be very careful about becoming somebody's, you know, guarantee or, or lender of things, right? My world, if I can't give it, then I'm, I'm just not going to be a bank, okay? That's how I work. But in Proverbs 17, 18, it says this, a man lacking in judgment strikes hands to ple pledge and puts up security for his neighbor. In other words, he guarantees for his neighbor. He's the bank for them. And, and we need not to do that because debt, especially when we assume it with our friends or our family, we become uh, the bad person and it's just bondage and it makes the relationship really weird, okay? Now, let's look at what debt is according to God's plan. I mean, what does de debt look like for God? What does he have to say about it? Well, believe it or not, God, God doesn't forbid debt. Nowhere in the Bible really can I see it where he's forbidding it, right? But he strongly discourages it. And so I want you to know that he wants us to have his thinking on it. So we need to immerse ourselves in, in scripture to start to see, well, what does that look like? And in Deuteronomy 28, the whole chapter is worthy looking at, all right? God really talks about debt in his people. And one of the things he says is, God says in that chapter is that he wants to bless people. He wants to bless the Israelites, right? And so he says, hey, I don't want you borrowing them. I want you to trust me for your provisions. And so he says this to them in Deuteronomy 28, 12. It's on your outline. You will, lead, you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. So he's making this statement. He's like, hey, I want you to be the head and not the tail. I, you know, if you're going to get into this, uh, you know, lending to nations, I want you to lend to them. I don't want you to be borrowing from them. I don't want you to be the tail. I don't want you to be paying the interest. Do you see that? Now, God was so much impassioned about debt and the devastation and the bondage it created. He even make a, he made a clause for his people here. And we see that in Deuteronomy 15, 1, it says, at the end of every seven years, you must cancel debt. Every seven years, you must cancel debt. So what God is saying is, I hate debt so much because I see that it creates bondage that for the family that I have put together here, I want you to let your people out every seven years, right? Why? Because he didn't want to have generations of poverty, right? So he had a way to, to circumvent that by saying every seven years, you're going to release those people. You're going to wipe their debt clean, God is very impassioned for his people. And he wants you to know that, again, that you are to be the head and not the tail. And you're to take care of each other. This whole concept of taking care of the people of God, which is you guys, we are so impassioned for that. That's why we bring you those, those classes like Dave Ramsey, the financial piece that's in January that you heard on the announcements. We bring that to you, not because we were like making money or anything. We bring that to you because we know and we are in passion that God's people should not be in debt. And that's one of those good programs that can help you. And so again, I'm pushing on the gas here that although God allows, you know, for us to get into debt, that's not his best plan for us. And so we need to shy away from that. But also, when debt does occur, and it does occur, I would venture to say most of you in here are in some kind of a debt, Right? This is what he has to say about it in Psalm 27, 21. The wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. And so what we see here is that God is saying to us, if you are borrowing money, you need to repay it. You need to, to repay it. And, and not to do that is actually wicked. It's the opposite of righteousness, right? That we need to pay when we borrow money. We need to pay it back. We need to give it back. And so that's not meant to condemn you, but that's meant to tell you that that is God's plan for us, for his children, is that if we borrow money, that we pay it back. Now, just like I said, every seven years, the debt was canceled. 
right? Our government has taken that idea, and in, in, in its plan is why they have, uh, you know, the, the different things that they have for, like, bankruptcy and stuff like that. But what's happening is people are taking advantage of that. They're getting off track. It makes good business sense. No. The plain truth of the matter is that God says you borrow the money, you give it back. That's his idea, okay? But he does have these provisions. So if you're one that had to walk that, there's no condemnation there. I get it. But we want to know what God's standard is here. So Sharon, is there any legitimate debt that we can occur at all? I searched the Bible, and this is the only one I found. It was in Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding, which is what I've been saying, except the continuous debt of, to love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Okay? So what we're seeing here is the only debt that God wants us to have is the debt to love each other. We owe that. We are indebted to others to love them. Why? If they're a pain in the butt especially, why are we indebted to love them, right? Because our great God has loved us with an unmatchable love, and we will forever be in debt to him. Do you see that? And so we need to love other people because of that. So you're going, okay, I get it. Eee, I yield. <laughs> I hear that. But I'm in debt. How am I going to get out? And you don't know the level of my debt. Well, this last part speaks to you. Debt requires strategy to break through. Debt requires strategies to break free of it. Okay, you got to get a strategy. You don't have to be a rocket scientist here, guys, but you do have to have a strategy. You got to make the effort to make this strategy work for you. And I put on your outline three things I think will help you, right? Three things that will help you to, to get the, this thing going. The first one, very common sense. I always start out with common sense. Stop using credit, right? Very simple. Stop using credit. I mean, stop using it to, to buy things. Start to use an envelope of cash or something. You know, think through your purchases, right? And so you need to have self-control in your spending. And if you don't, I would say that you probably need to take your credit card and do plastic surgery. <laughs> you need to cut it up, right? Get rid of it. You don't want that. And one of the things I think, and this is how it works, one of the things in our culture, I think, that is an overfunded item for Americans is this whole idea of the automobile, the car, right? The car. We spend so much thinking money on our car because our cars are no longer just for transportation. They now are somehow become a personal statement of who I am, right? And because we've bought that from, from the media and advertisers have taught you those things, guys, we've gotten locked into it where many of us are car poor, right? Because we bought a car that was, you know, so much money, and we ran right up to the limit because, hey, it projects who I am, right? I know I'm going to get stones here. But here's the deal. The cheapest car that you can own, right, is the best car for you right now. And if you could sell your car and get a cheaper one, because it's only for being able to do transportation, and you don't want to be locked into these, you know, these, these deals where you're paying four or $500 a month just to drive a car around, to take you from point A to point B, right? And, you know, when you buy a car and you drive it off the lot, no, no, most of you know this, you lose 33% right when you drive it off, which means this $30,000 car that you bought is now worth $21,000. If you're locked into $400 payments or $500 payments every, every month, then what happens the first year, you're upside down in your car. It is worth less than what you bought it, so you're paying more for it, and you can't get out of it. That's that bondage I was talking about. We need to take our cue from the Apostle Paul who says in Philippians 4.11, I, Paul, have learned to be content whether, whatever the circumstances. He had plenty and he had little, and he found contentment. Why? Because he didn't make it about who he was, about the possessions that he had, but about whom he belonged to. He belonged to the Lord, and he knew that. And that's where he found his, his strength to stand up to a culture and said, it doesn't matter. You can take it all away from me, and you can give it all to me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect who I am with the Heavenly Father. We need to take that example. Now, how do you have this, how do you have this strategy to repay a debt when you're in debt? 
Well, Proverbs 21, 5 says the plans, and I want you to circle that word plans, of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. We need to be diligent about getting back to repaying the plans and not being stuck there, but to, to put forth effort. And I'm going to give you four things here just really quickly, and you can write them down, right? You can write them down on the margin. This is one of those practical steps you can take. First one, if you have debt, credit card debt specifically, right? I'm going to say that you can use something called a snowball plan. It's not my idea. Dave Ramsey came up with this, but I happen to think it's a great plan. It's where you lay out those credit cards that you have, and you look for the one with the minimum amount of payment. You're going to pay them all, but you look for the one with the minimum amount of payment, and you go after that thing. You not only meet the, what they're asking you, but you surpass it, double it, triple it, and you work hard and you work diligently to, to eradicate that one debt, and then you take all that money that was being spent there, and then you dump it onto the next lowest one, right? Why is that? Because when we... Uh, when we're playing a game, right? You know, when we get close, like in football, when you get close to that end zone and you know you can't get in it, you kick, right? You, you know, hit a, uh, kick it in and, and you get the three points, right? You go for a field goal. Doesn't it make you feel good? Yay, I got something. Better than nothing. Well, that's what that does. When you've paid off one, that's that feeling that you get inside. And then you just keep moving them over and moving them over until you've eradicated every credit card debt that you've had. Now, remember, we've stopped using credit cards at this point, right? And so now we're putting into play this snowball effect, which works well. Another thing I think you can do is to commit to every time that God blesses you with something extra money-wise, it goes towards your debt. Not fun and play and, ooh -hoo, I got a lot of money. Let's go out to dinner, right? When you get your tax return, when you get a birthday you know, or a bonus, a birthday card with money or a bonus and things like that. Take that money and put it towards your debt because you are serious about eradicating that. The next thing I thought about is you can sell assets. You can sell things around your house. I mean, how many of us, if you walk through, you go, I never use that. I don't use that. I don't use that, right? Put it on eBay or have a garage sale or go to a pawn shop. You know, one of the interesting things I found was I had... I, I'm an older gal, so I had a lot of jewelry that I don't wear or that was broken. Yeah, I throw it in my jewelry box, right? And so somebody challenged me once, take that, that's gold stuff, take it down the pawn shop, see how much you get. I was amazed, right? I was amazed. I thought, well, gosh, it was just wasting space. But I made all the money. When we make money like that, then we take it and we dump it back into our, uh, you know, our debt that we have. And then the last one I wanted to give you. If you're in heavy credit debt and you have a lot of cards, I want you to go specifically look at the interest rates. Did you know that you can lobby for them to be less? Right? Ooh, I just empowered you. That's right. You can get on the phone and you can talk to the creditor. And I know when you say, you know, you just say to them, my interest rate's too high, I want you to lower it. They're going to say, we can't do that. Right? Then you go, I want to talk to a supervisor. And then you tell that supervisor, you plan to take your business, to pay off that bill and take your business to another credit card company that will give you a better interest rate. And see what happens, right? Now, just a little caveat, make sure you have a name of another company that will give you a lower rate, right, to use in your arsenal. Guys, that's four very simple, they're not rocket science, four very simple things that you can apply to get out of debt, that you can step forward in that, in that way. The next one that I have on your outline, to be able to have a strategy to not just get free, but to stay free, is that we need to create a spending plan. We just got to have it. You know, in Luke 14, 28, it says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? In other words, he has a plan. Week two, Pastor Samuel Mead talked to you about getting a budget going, this is a great idea because a budget, what it does is it doesn't allow us to impulse buy. You know, it, it curves our appetite to, to spend like that and also to spend more than we're actually making, okay? It's keeping tabs on it. And so a budget is a great strategy, you know, on the road to success of staying out of that debt area. Now, last week I introduced you to the 10-10-80 plan. Write that down. 10, 10, 80. Remember I talked about 10% goes to the Lord, 10% goes towards your saving, and you live on the 80%. Today, as I'm talking to you, I still maintain the 10% needs to go to the Lord. Why? Because my whole life 
is about him and yours should be also and to promote and to uh, follow after what he asks us to do in the scriptures we put temper sense aside off my gross at the beginning why because it says it's all yours god here's the 10 percent you give me in your word that i'm going to give and pledge to your ministries right or to your ministry and then tell me what to do next and we know he doesn't like debt so i'm going to propose that you go after your debt before you even do your savings whoa really yeah that 10 percent i'm going to say go after your debt to retire your debt go after it with all your heart to eradicate that and then once you get that to a place where it's eliminated or it's very low then you can start to do your savings that's the other 10 percent 80 percent we learn to live on 80 percent we adjust our lifestyle to live on the 80 percent and we use our we use what we have uh, been given to the best of our ability we don't live outside our means now i've just given you a whole plan on how to how to address uh being able to to break free of debt you know but the biggest debt before i this is this i want to close but i was thinking about this the biggest debt that you and i will ever have is to the father god right that's the most indebtedness that we will ever have and i want to show you the freedom from that biggest debt how and where that came from you and i we are very indebted but in it, but it has has been addressed for us okay and what we see here is that if you yeah i hear that if you underestimate your own sin in your life then you're fooling yourself okay if you think oh, i'm not that bad yeah maybe you're not maybe you're better than me i know that i'm the scum of the earth in front of my heavenly father i know that and so the only way i can stand before him is to be able to have jesus christ take that that indebtedness from my sin it's the only way i can stand before him and listen each and every one of us will stand before god almighty and we have to give an account for how we spend our life everybody everybody in this room nobody is exempt from that and so i want to encourage you to know that if you think you can go before him going well let me justify why well, i did what i did <laughs> right it all shows up it all shows up and so we need to know that our indebtedness is so huge that there's only one thing that can save us and that is his son jesus christ because god took care of that for us look at this last scripture here on your outline colossians 2 13 and 14 it says when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh god made you alive with christ he forgave us all our sins having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness that's our sin right which stood against us and condemned us he has taken it away and nailed it on the cross now guys i'm giving you this message and i want you to hear it loud and clear that there is only one way to stand between uh, to before the father and that's with the blood of jesus christ that's with understanding and accepting this idea of who he is right that he's a holy god i'm a sinful person and it's jesus that covers my sin and so i'm telling you this because i want you to pass i want you to pass the test when you stand before him you do not want him to see you you want him to see you through his son jesus right and so just hearing this message is not enough you have to know you have to know that you need to respond to it so those of you who don't know christ you don't have this personal relationship i'm going to close now in prayer and i want i'm going to give you the opportunity to pray with me and god brought you here today because he wanted you to hear that you matter to him and he wants you to be with him but the only way is through his son jesus but you get to willingly decide you get to choose what you're going to do and for those of us who have decided to follow after jesus he got us out of debt right why would we commit ourselves back into debt into a different kind of debt but it's debt none of the same why wouldn't we set ourselves free to follow the leading of the holy spirit to be able to do what he asked us to do and so i want to encourage you to adopt that philosophy to begin to think about it allow it to permeate who you are so you can break free do you see that all right let's bow our heads and i'm going to pray yes father 
Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd come right now. Yeah. Father, would you do what nobody else could do? Would you come and would you reveal your truth? You say to have ears what this, to hear what the Spirit is saying. So, Father, there's, there's so much noise that's going on around us. We have a hard time hearing you. And so I ask that you would quiet it all, Lord, that we might be keenly aware of your voice, even in this moment. Yeah. Father says that he loves all people, but he loves you so much that he gives you free choice. Mm -hmm. And so if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, and you don't have him as your Savior, today I'm going to give you the opportunity to pray with me. And you can do it right now, right where you're at, because it's between you and him. It has nothing to do with me or anybody around you. And those of us that made that decision, you'd be praying for those that are making that decision this morning. So if you want this relationship, you want to have the answer when you stand before the God Almighty, then you just say, Father God, say it right where you're at. Father God, I don't get it all but I want to be right before you. So Jesus Christ, forgive me for my sins, my bad choices. And Jesus, today, the best way I can, I ask you to be the leader of my life. I turn my life over to you. Now, Father, for those praying that prayer, I ask that you seal it in their heart. And I thank you that your word promises that you've written their name in the book of life. I thank you for that, Father. I thank you that they are now children of the God Most High. And Father, for us that you have called us, I ask again, Lord, that you would cause us to have courage within our own selves to tackle the debt that each and every one of us have gotten ourselves into. That we would be the head and not the tail. Father, help your people. Have mercy on your people, Lord God. Shake them out of their complacency this day. May they feel you. May they know you. May they follow you with every fiber of their being, with every thought that they have, with every heart that beats within their chest. May they follow after you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com and we'll see you next week.